Bulletproof Radio, a state of high performance. You're listening to Bulletproof Radio with Dave Asprey. Today's cool fact of the day is that gratitude changes patterns of activity in your brain. In the last 15 years, researchers have really just exploded in the amount of effort that they're putting into the science of gratitude. We now know that when you focus on gratitude, it activates your brainstem region that produces dopamine, and it can also boost your serotonin levels. But they've also found that gratitude can have a profound and long-term neural effect, like a study at Indiana University of Bloomington that focused on people with anxiety or depression. Participants had a gratitude exercise of writing letters of thanks to people in their lives, and three months later underwent brain scans. During those scans, all the subjects participated in another gratitude task where they could choose between keeping money for themselves or giving it away. Those who choose to give money away exhibited a specific pattern of activity in their brains. Even months later, they still showed more gratitude-related brain activity under a scanner. And the team of researchers described this as a profound and long-term neural effect simply from focusing on feelings of being grateful. That is awesome. And as you may have predicted, we will be talking about gratitude with a world-leading expert, as you've come to expect. And first, I'm going to propose something for you. If you'd like your own personal gratitude exercise like the one just described, find three books that have absolutely changed your life, go to Amazon and leave a review, and thank the author for what they've done for you. And if any of my books are on the list, great. And if they're not, that's okay. Go out there. <laughs> And just say thanks to people who do that kind of work or just write a letter to your mom. Whatever it is, do that right now and the world will be a better place and your brain may be better neurologically. Now, today's guest is a returning guest to Bulletproof Radio. He is a distinguished university scientist, surprisingly at Indiana University of Bloomington, where he's the founding director of the Traumatic Stress Research Consortium at the Kinsey Institute. And he's also the guy who created the polyvagal theory of how the vagal nerve works. And if you missed that episode, it was episode number 264. Uh, it was one of my favorite episodes of Bulletproof Radio. And Stephen Porges is very well known in medical circles for his deep and profound understanding of how our nervous system works and how gratitude works as well. Uh, Stephen, welcome to the show. Well, thank you, David. And thank you for having me here a second time. So we can explore other issues. Back when I was still in university, uh, you proposed this idea of polyvagal theory to link our autonomic nervous system to our social behaviors. And you looked at the physiological states in what would happen when people had behavioral problems or even just, just who were a little bit on the psychiatric spectrum. It's now been, see, that was 1994. So it's been a good 20, I don't know, a lot of years later. <laughs> and uh, uh, I guess I'm getting old when I think about that. Jeez. Anyway, what made you get into this in the first place, Stephen? Like, why, why the vagal nerve? Okay. I started with different levels of questions. I was very curious about what was going on uh, in people's minds when they were interacting with, uh, with me or with others. Um, it was this curiosity that people would say certain things and you knew that they meant something totally different. And I would start looking at cues or facial cues, the intonation of voice, posture, and gesture. And I became, in a sense, a good observer of what people, of the intentionality of what people really wanted in their interaction. And when I started, there really wasn't a science of this. And I got very interested in this new science when I went off to graduate school in the Actually, I went to graduate school, started in 1966, so we're talking about a long time ago. And there was this new branch of science called psychophysiology, and it was really the part of science that was really investigating mind-body issues or mind-body sciences. And of course, that's coming of age now, but it really wasn't of age in the 60s. And the part of it that was really interesting is that people were there trying to measure uh physiological responses, whether it was brainwave activity or heart rate changes or sweat gland activity, they were trying to measure these as they were parallels or substrates of cognitive functioning and emotional functioning. And I was just extraordinarily intrigued with this. 
And I started to work on measures of intentionality, which we called attention at that time, attending to something, and started to observe on a physiograph, on the machine that measures physiological responses, that there were changes in the patterning of heart rate. And thus, I saw changes in heart rate variability. And that was before anyone else had quantified heart rate variability, which is a general common variable that lots of people measure. For listeners who haven't heard the term heart rate variability, can you just define that for them? Sure. Our heart does not beat at a constant rate. Even though you go to a physician's office, they tell you what your heart rate is. That's just an average of many, many different heart rates over a period of time. So the heart is, in in a sense, just waiting there, sitting there beating at a constant level. It's being affected by our nervous system, and that neural influence provides beat-to-beat changes in rate. And it creates the rate changes are actually create a pattern. And when the pattern shows nice sinusoidal, nice rhythmic changes, it tends to show good neural control, good uh, neural feedback from our brainstem to those target organs, in this case, the heart. So, But when I started, people were making certain assumptions, and one of the assumptions was that the heart was just beating. And when you start to put electrodes to measure the ECG and measure beat-to-beat changes, there were unique patterns of how people's heart rate pattern, heart rate changes looked. And what I started to find out, there were two important aspects of this initial research. One, that when people got focused or attended, their heart rate patterns became much more stable, meaning the variations of heart rate were greatly reduced. So I started to operationalize that changes in heart rate variability were an index of attention. But then the research became much more intriguing because the base levels, when people weren't attending, you could make predictions of what their heart rate responses would look like and whether they would go- were good on attention man- demanding tasks like reaction time. So if they had a lot of systematic heart rate variability, they were the ones that suppressed or reduced the variability the most, and they were the ones that had the fastest reaction times. So I got interested in that, and that's where it started. So so if you can raise your heart rate variability, it could raise your reaction time and make you less ADD? Um, Yes. Well, let me me give you the full. (laughs) The issue is if you can control your heart rate variability, you will probably become less ADD. I I did learn to control my heart rate variability. In in 2008, I started becoming an advisor to the HeartMath Institute. Just for for people listening who don't know the full Bulletproof story, it was one of the things that really made a difference is that I, I didn't realize that you felt different, but there is a connection there. Yeah. Uh, and, it, and it's a learnable skill is why I'm offering Well, let, let's, let's go through really what we're talking about. Yeah. Um, basically, the brainstem is the pivot point between uh, bra- higher brain structures and our bodily organs. And what we are always looking for, and this is what I would say is my mission in life or mission in science, was in search of what I call the intervening variable. Now, coming from a psychology perspective, people would talk about stimulus response. And in basic science, people would talk about input and output. And I was actually seeking what goes in between. And that in-between variable in in scientific models, especially in psychological models, is called a measure of organismic state. And what I really was discovering was that if you measure this neural regulation of autonomic state, you could make very strong predictions between stimulus and response. So now, coming back to your question, if a person has great difficulty in inhibiting or regulating their behavior, most likely that intervening variable can be detected by measuring heart rate variability and the regulation of it. That makes a lot of sense. Uh, I've, uh, it, when, when I spent more time coaching people individually, I would just tell them, you've got to learn how to do your heart rate variability. You know, it's a hundred bucks or something, uh, for a little sensor to do that. And the feedback from people, whether they were engineers or bankers or, or anything else was, it was nothing short of, of 
amazing uh, because these people are already performing really well it would say things like everything got easier <laughs> well they, they didn't have to fight their body but there's certain it says background events occurring in that process of trying to learn how to control heart rate variability one is that you tend to change how you breathe you tend to use more diaphragmatic abdominal breathing and you tend to extend the duration of exhalations so you breathe out for longer periods of time and you breathe in for shorter, relatively shorter periods of time. And that's when you now, when that, when you start thinking about that, you get at the mechanisms of what heart rate variability is. And those mechanisms are regulating the heart through vagal pathways. And the vagus is this big cranial nerve that goes from our brainstem and goes to many organs, especially the heart. And it goes right to our heart's pacemaker. And when you have a lot of vagal control coming through that nerve to the heart, it inhibits the pacemaker. It basically slows the heart rate up. And then when you change your breathing pattern, meaning when you start to inhale, it takes that inhibitory vagal break off the sinoatrial node, off the pacemaker, and the heart rate starts to go faster. So the heart rate goes slower when we exhale slowly and goes faster when we inhale. Uh, so that is related to the things the military does uh, with a, a box breath mm -hmm. where they, they teach people to calm themselves. And that's something that uh, breath work is something I've talked about quite a bit on the show. And, and it, it's directly affecting your heart, which is directly affecting the, the vagal nerve. Right. Kind of the order of operations there, right? Right. But if we think a little differently and we say not, we don't use the term affecting the vagal nerve but fit, uh, affecting the regulation of our autonomic nervous system through the vagal nerve. Oh, there you so go. we don't want to give intelligence where intelligence is not necessarily there. It's the brain oh, stem that's, that's traveling, sends signals that travel through that nerve. And so when we shift our breathing, as people do when they chant or when they do breathing exercises, it shifts the neural regulation of the autonomic nervous system. And these, in my metaphors, become neural exercises. So singing, uh, breathing exercises, chanting, and even playing wind instruments become a neural exercise that enhances the regulation of those physiological states. Is this one of those reasons that people who play the didgeridoo are always weird? <laughs> um, we could go there, but I'm not sure we want to. <laughs> <laughs> but we could say that I actually where I would give you a an idea to think about for someone else's episode is that if you utilize a wind instrument, then for your your ability to regulate state, then maybe you are not uh, interacting and regulating with another or let's say a significant other enough. Oh, interesting. <laughs> so, so this gets at your issue of weirdness that in. So what polyvagal theory also uncovered was the whole aspect of our evolution, which was to signal uh, conspecifics, those of our species that we were safe enough to come close to so that we could regulate each other's physiological state, meaning making individuals feel safe. Now, if someone's playing a didgeridoo, I can't even pronounce it, so help me out on that. <laughs> didgeridoo. Didger didgeridoo. Uh, they're regulating their state without another individual. Ah, interesting. So there could be relationship things. I actually do have a didgeridoo, and I'm not that good at circular breathing, but you, you look at this very, very long, slow exhales. That was the instrument that came to yeah. mind that had the most things. And frankly, most of the people I know who are really good at playing the didge are people I really like, but they're also people who are probably not average. <laughs> <laughs> so. But, you know... Uh, even playing a wind instrument, even without circular breathing, uh, using deep abdominal, just so when, when I was trained as a clarinetist, there was no real inhalation. It was an active dropping of the diaphragm. It was all passive. And, and, and that enabled me uh, to play. Uh, I could hold my breath or ex exhale slowly for well over a minute playing music. So. One of the things that I learned to do over the last just 20 years of learning to better manage my own biology was to breathing control sorts of things like that. And I got to the point where I could do one breath per minute mm. you know, between the inhale and the exhale. And I, I could do that for 
minutes at a time, uh, which, which was sort of strange, but you're just really slowly breathing in, holding for all really slowly breathing yeah. out. Uh, but I didn't do it by playing a wind instrument uh, very well. All right. I have a question for you though. It goes beyond that. Uh, you've, you created a music based intervention called safe and sound protocol, yeah. which 1200 therapists use to improve spontaneous social engagement, reduce hearing sensitivities, improve language processing, and even uh, just just people's ability to regulate their states. Tell me about what that is, because that sounds too good to be true, even though I know it's real. <laughs> well, let's simplify this and say that what is this device or this process doing? It's functionally an acoustic vagal nerve stimulator. We have to go back down to that level. And what it's doing, it's modulating acoustic information that our nervous system is waiting for. It's, it's cues of safety and trust. So when, it, when a baby is crying and dysregulated and the mother sings a lullaby, what happens to the baby's physiological state? It calms right. down. What happens to, uh, if, if a father who's irritated by a crying baby tries to signal to the baby to stop crying, what does a baby do? It tends to cry more because the father's voice will tend to be at lower frequencies and less melodic. If you have a puppy you and your puppy is kind of uncomfortable, you know, as puppies are, you talk to the puppy uh, in a, uh, a pet ease or mother-like voice. And males do very well with talking to their puppies that well, less well talking to their children. So the nervous system uh, is basically prepared to extract signals of safety and so what we have is a neural circuit that when it, it, our body feels safe, it changes the neural tone to the muscles of the face and head. So our voices change. We become less threatening when we talk to each other. The upper part of our face becomes more alive and engaged. And when that occurs, the muscles, the nerves to the muscles in the middle ear start to dampen out low frequency sounds so that we can do better extracting human voice. Wow. Now, that, that whole system, which I call the social engagement system, is linked to the vagal pathways that go to the heart and also vagal pathways that go to larynx and pharynx that regulate voice. So we can hear it in people's voices, their physiological state. And this goes back to where I started. If we go back to the 60s, why I was interested in this whole area, why did people's voices tell me so much about who they were more than what they were actually saying. Mm. And remember, we live in a culture that says it's not how I say it, it's what I say. And our nervous system has it totally reversed. It's not what we are saying, it's how you say it, that our nervous system responds to. You remind me of uh, a famous guy named uh, Erickson. <laughs> uh, uh, I'm hoping I remember which of the famous uh, psychiatrists, psychologists this was. A guy who as a child was paralyzed in bed for a long period of time. Uh, it is Erickson, right? I don't know. Okay. I mean, you just, so it, that, I, that story, yeah. I don't know, but oh, okay. I'm, I'm, I'm uh, a listener. A child, it was a childhood disease. And, uh, this, this guy just laid there. It was basically his, his sisters had to come in and feed him. And he was so bored mm -hmm. as, as a young man that he started observing the social interactions because he had nothing else to do. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. he realized that what people would do with their tone of voice, with mm -hmm. their eye movements, with the, the way they shook their head in a subtle way, the way they would say yes or they would say mm -hmm. no, uh, that this was providing so much more information yeah, yeah. than what they were actually saying that it led to the creation of a school of psychology. And I bring this up because Robert Greene writes about this in the first rule in his most recent book. This is the guy who wrote 48 Laws of Power and one of my favorite authors on the planet who's about to come back on the show uh, again. But the idea there is, is when you observe all of the small details that no one else sees, you yeah. suddenly have this view like Neo from the Matrix who just sees zeros <laughs> and ones. You're yeah. like a Neo yeah. in that when you listen to someone speak and when you mm -hmm. see them move, you have this complete superpower to understand what's going on. I'm trying to figure out, is this because you have 40 years of, of, of clinical experience? Like, how did you get that? Well, <laughs> let, let's... let's uh, this had it. first of all, I am not a clinician, so I was a scientist. Okay. It wasn't clinical, who, all right. So, so I was a scientist who then got invited into clinical environments, and I, I love 
the way that people treat me. They say I'm a I'm a scientist with the heart of a clinician, <laughs> and I and I welcome that. And but how did I get there? I got there through observation and from theory development. Most people who just observe don't go to the next step, which is try to make it into a theoretical system so you can figure it out. And with the theory, you can find things that you haven't seen. You can actually do the research to identify more things. But there's one point. So when we talk about um, being able to extract that information, there's another part of the whole story, is that when you extract it, what do you do as a human being? You become available to that other person because you know what that other person really wants. So you become accessible, meaning that your voice doesn't go into high frequencies and start screaming at people. You try not to argue, which is not very easy, especially right. for an academic from the East Coast on top of that. <laughs> uh, all these features, we realize uh, when you start looking at the dimensions, you realize that you can't win an argument. There are, there are no arguments mm -hmm. that you can win because there's an emotive underlying part of an argument. So that you have to understand that you have to be physiologically safe to have a really good discussion, which might be intellectual debate, but you have to be physiologically safe. And what happens in most interactions, someone loses it. And what does that mean from my perspective? They're no longer safe. Now, I'll get a little bit personal here. I was born uh, with the umbilical cord wrapped around my neck. Mm -hmm. I didn't lose oxygen to the brain or get brain damage or anything like that. And I had no idea this had anything to do with my, uh, my psychology or anything mm. in my life until I was uh, 30 and really started digging deep. And to this day, even with all the work I've done, if you run one of those uh, psychological profiles where you look at someone's face and you have to identify just as mm. a photo, is are they happy or are they angry? I'll see angry face three times faster than I see happy face. And I, I'm kind of still wired that way. You're not wired that way. Let, let's start right. really picking at your operational definitions. I love You're it. You're in a state that has a negative bias. There you go. Okay. Now, if we shift at your state, your bias might and should spontaneously change. So that yeah. you see what your problem, and this is a well-known phenomenon, is that I, I coined a term that I called neuroception, which is our, our nervous system's uh, ability to detect risk or evaluate risk of the environment without awareness. Right. And what happens is that when you shift states, your perception, this is your cognitions, take on a bias. Mm -hmm. So if you're in a more, quote, mobilized state, which we go back to the hyperactivity and the, and the uh, little irritability in your a uh, nervous system, your bias mm -hmm. would be very much towards negativity. You know uh, that that has been the case throughout the at least the first half of my life, and I'm I'm really on top of that. And I I'm certain that I can rewire myself, and I have in lots of ah, different ways. Not, gratitude, so, and things like so, that. So the, the change the pattern in your language there. So we don't want to use the term rewire. We want to have access to oh, thinking more in terms of portals. Basically, this is a, we're going to play with the word gratitude for a moment. All right. We're going to say have more gratitude for what you have or what has come into the world with you. And don't be so negatively evaluative of, of, of who you are that you need to rewire. Uh, your body in safe environments will start to spontaneously optimize those circuits so that we need to structure narratives that have a degree of positivity so that our nervous system doesn't feel too too scared to evaluate it. And I love the way you say the nervous system feeling too scared because I went through this long, um, I went through this long uh, process where I would feel, I, I, would, I wouldn't I would recognize that I was feeling unsafe because I would think about it and I'd say, well, there's no reason to be afraid right now, uh, so therefore I'm not afraid, not recognizing that physiologically my body was in yeah. that state, but that my brain wasn't. And that mismatch really confused me for years. Mm -hmm. and, and now I, I'm wired to the wired in and not in a in a unflexible way, but just I'm connected to the ability to, to sense when my body's triggered. And sometimes I don't know why, but at least I can change my behavior. 
Well, see, I wouldn't, I, I would play with this. I would say, yeah. I would say often changing the behavior is not the first goal. The first goal is literally self-compassion and respect and witnessing your physiological state and realizing the vulnerabilities of your physiology. And then just like a beautiful suitcase, you take it to a place where it can be safer. You, you basically move your body into a place where it can function. So for people with low thresholds, people who are hyperactive, uh, the environment can be very disruptive, can get their bodies very, uh, people use terms like wired, they don't yep. feel present. Well, what their body is telling them, because they're very aware of the body's change, they're not aware of the cues that are sending it on that journey. Mm -hmm. But as we learn, there are certain cues that do send it. There are cues of safety and there are cues of danger and there are cues of life threat. And once we become aware of this, we take on a different responsibility. We say, I've got to take care of my body. It doesn't do yeah. well in these situations. And the irony of all this is, once you start taking care of it, it becomes much more resilient. And now you can intrude yeah. into these other places. And the paradox becomes our environment doesn't respect that, or let's say is ignorant of it. And we say people have to do this. They have to, quote, learn to do this. And the learning is not the strategy. It's the support of their body that is the strategy. I love the way you, you said that, and it, it ties back into that core definition of biohacking that is now a real word in the English language uh, as of last year. Um, and the definition that actually isn't the full one in the dictionary, but the one that I, I wrote when I was creating this, this field was change the environment around you and inside of you so that you have control of your own biology. And, yeah. and that the body will listen to that mm -hmm. even, uh, even if you don't want it to. <laughs> yes. So our first uh, interview, which must be two years ago or so, yeah. Uh, we got into a discussion on biohacking. I said, stop there or something. That's not the strategy. But I will also tell you what I'm working on. So I am actually finalizing a utility patent, Ooh. which has a lot of these features of of reading the body and changing the environment to support the body. Well, I am exceptionally excited to uh, see that patent as soon as it's, it's visible or just whatever work you're doing based yeah. on it. Because... I think this is one of the keys to unlocking hmm. uh, the innate kindness that's built into humans is you, you have to feel safe and you have to have enough energy too. You can feel safe and just be too tired to do anything about it. But yeah. it, if you're energetic and you're not triggered, you're mm -hmm. probably going to help other people. Oh, so l let's, let's hold that for a second and okay. let's talk really about uh, the culture. All right. So the culture is a culture of danger and threat. And we're led to believe through all our institutions, education, um, uh, the media and everything, that our goal in life is to remove threat from our environment. Mm -hmm. Our nervous system tells us that's not enough. It says you can remove all the threat and it doesn't make you feel safe. Your nervous system wants something else. And that's, so if we go back to what safe and sound protocol is, it's trying to give the nervous system that something else. And then you see what spontaneously emerges. And it's really quite spectacular in many individuals. Now, the issue is it works extraordinarily well with kids on spectrum and children with language and learning uh, delays. But now with people with severe trauma, it does something different. Many people who have heard me talk, they want to use it if they had had trauma. And, they, and many of them happen to be therapists, so they'll go and order it, and they'll do it by themselves. And they miss the first word of the protocol, which is safe and sound. They, they put it on without the support, without the caring individual to help them regulate, because the sound of safety to a person with trauma is a trigger. It says, you can trust me. And of course, a person who's been violated if someone says, trust me, what, what does their body say? Been fooled once, not going to be fooled again. So initially, the body will relax and do it, and suddenly they'll get very anxious as the body retracts and tries to protect itself from those cues. And an astute trauma-oriented therapist can now work with a client through those stages.
Now, uh, you're listening to this going, what the heck? If you have had serious trauma, there's a substantial chance if it happened earlier in your life, you don't even know you did, uh, which is the case for me. <laughs> yeah, well, we can, we, we can talk about yours and the, what that is. The reason yours is important from a, I'll use the term polyvagal theory, is that with the cord around the neck, there's a, ten, there's a high probability that there's a reduced level of oxygen, even though your APCARs were probably okay, and even yeah. though your, your perinatal variables were. It doesn't mean that you didn't have a transitory shutting down, or the body got this yeah. bit of lack of oxygen, and then the body kind of recovered. It's like the first hit that creates a vulnerability. It's like a, a traumatized individual who says, uh, my body is looks fine, but now someone becomes tries to engage me, and now it feels like I'm being seduced by a predator because I don't want to be vulnerable. Mm -hmm. So you, your body, in fact, uh, I've had a, uh, a, a many decade long uh, quest, I'll use the word, to study individuals who had uh, babies, who survived delivery, who had meconium, which is fetal feces coming mm -hmm. out, uh, but then had normal APGARs because you get the feces coming out due to a hypoxic episode, a lack of oxygen. It's part of that ancient reptilian diving reflex, which is part in polyvagal theory of the shutdown response. And it's part of what many survivors of trauma describe, the immobilization, the passing out, the dissociation. That's the defecation is part of that same physiology. It's fascinating you bring that up because I just interviewed Lieutenant Colonel Grossman, who wrote the books on combat and on killing, who described that exact same response in first responders and SWAT team members, yeah. even well-trained ones. A firefight happens, and if there's uh, some little extra feces, it's probably going to be in your pants. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so it, it's wired in at a very low level, uh, the reptilian oh, level, you're saying. Oh, it, it's, it's survival yeah. and also nausea. And mm -hmm. so these, the coupling of defecation and nausea is adapted for a reptile that has to go underwater, hold its breath for several hours, because you get rid of metabolic demands of digestion. Wow. So you follow, so the diarrhea and, and, and nausea have adaptive function when you get triggered into these ancient circuits. The body is an amazing, resilient uh, survival yeah. machine. Yeah, <laughs> in ways but, that, that but, are beautiful, but, but kind of gross. <laughs> but but to loop it all back is that when we understand what the body is trying to do for our survival, yeah, there's a type of if we go use the word gratitude, mm -hmm. well, that gratitude for those events in our lives give us a different story, a different narrative. And now, if you soiled your pants and that bit. It's no longer shame and embarrassment. It's yeah. like, wow, look what my body was trying to do for me. And yeah. those are the narratives that we need to to have as opposed to humiliating people. It's really awesome the way you, you just set that up. You know, be grateful that your body is doing all these things. Even if they aren't necessarily what you wanted, there was probably a reason. Uh, but the, it seems like the intelligence of that system isn't that good it's reactive it's fast but it doesn't have context oh, right oh it has context and it is good because its survival is its highest priority and for us we have other priorities how people look at us how they think about us um it makes the decision extraordinarily rapidly our body shifts state quickly we can feel the body state shift and we can we can perceive that but we can't detect the the features always that trigger our body into those states you're one of the the game changers who made it into uh into the game changers the book and you're in law 44 about gratitude and you just you showed a really cool way to use gratitude towards you know, physiological responses that you might not like but that are there for a good reason and the law in the book is it states, overcoming fear that doesn't serve you is necessary to access your greatness. Courage works, but it takes a lot of energy. Save courage for when your life is on the line. The rest of the time, use gratitude to turn off fear at the cellular level. Freedom from fear leads to happiness, and happiness makes you perform best at whatever you choose to do. Yeah. 
Uh, how would you recommend that people listening to the show bring this gratitude online on a on a frequent or even constant basis? Like, how do you do it? How do I? And that's personal. <laughs> okay, it's, fine. I, how do people do it? Then I don't know how uh, you do okay, it. Okay, <laughs> okay. Uh, so I go back to polyvagal theory, and we've been talking about low levels of defense or shutting down, which is this ancient uh, dorsal vagal, an old vagal circuit that when we are safe, that same vagal circuit enables us to explain or enjoy stillness, enables us to have moments of intimacy. So the shutting down, the moments of intimacy are where our bodies conform with others and we feel safe. And it's a physiological state that now supports health growth and restoration and not passing out, defecating, and potentially dying. Same circuit, but something's been added to it. And the part that's been added to it is a very special mammalian circuit that is our circuit that identifies whether we're safe. So when the system comes on, it coordinates the older circuits. So the new system is the social engagement system with the muscles of the face and the voice, and that's linked to the myelinated vagal control of the heart. And when that comes on board, it allows these other circuits, and there's a second one, our fight-flight system that everyone talks about is stress and fight-flight. But few people talk about the mixture of movement or mobilization, which is fight flight, but putting it together with social engagement. That's play. That's interactive play. That's dancing. That's team sports. That's movement and maintaining some level of social interaction. So as we evolved, we got this wonderful circuit that took the old defense circuits and uh, basically restructured them, restructured how they would work in our society and in how we live, to have lots of uh, attributes of pleasure. So you're saying to experience more gratitude, play more? I'm saying that gratitude comes out when we feel safe. Because if you're fearful or under great threat, you're not going to have experiences of gratitude. It's just not going to happen. So the experiences of feeling safe are the use of this new mammalian circuit, which in a sense choreographs these older circuits, keeps them under containment or keeps them in a, in a functional level. A way of, of, of thinking about this is that we have tools in our body that we inherited from very, very primitive organisms. But it is only when we use our mammalian structures can we then take those tools and repurpose them for play, and for intimacy. However, if we're in environments and where threat is the constant feature of the environment, we can't turn off our defenses because this social component is there to turn off defenses because our nervous system evolved to be a good fighter, to be good defensive, not to be hit by cars or to fall down staircases or elevator shafts, to be aware of our context but our nervous system also evolved to know when it's safe. And, and when it's safe, it can then repurpose these other systems and circuits. And just as I'm looking at you, you're in a relatively confined environment. You don't have to be hypervigilant of people walking behind you or people intruding on you or uh, hurting you. You can now engage me. Because I'm, st I'm in my studio and I'm right. the only one and, here. Right? And, but but what, what we're defining, we're defining what structures do for us. Physical structures enable our nervous system not to be hypervigilant so that we can be socially engaged. Now, if you're in a cubicle that has walls so you can't see who's coming towards you and it has an opening and your back is to the opening and you're under some nice fluorescent lights uh, with, with a lot of background noise, what does that do? Well, I mean, I would assume that you know what it does or you wouldn't ask me. But, of course, the noise, the vulnerability, the lack of privacy, um, it's going to shift physiological state. And it certainly it's not a place where I would, would want to spend any time. 
And even if I were, let's say, much younger and had much more resilience, uh, I wouldn't really want to be there. So it, it makes a, it makes for a less pleasant working environment. It if you could wave a magic wand and re envision the typical office worker environment to one that would increase human performance and make people feel safe, what would it look like at a high level? Well, the first okay, so I'm going to do a ninety degree, no, no, a forty five degree shift and tell you that I tried to I. Not tried. I designed the school for autism. I designed the physical plan for a school for autism. Wow. And I think some of the features would be very good <laughs> for what you're talking about, the highest level of corporate. So I, I use it. Let's start with lighting. I didn't use direct lights. I washed the light on the white walls and on the ceiling. It just reflected <laughs> off of it. I, I want to okay. aim my camera at the ceiling right now. My yeah. whole office is set up that way. Okay. okay. <laughs> so you understand that part. Yeah. But I also had lots of windows, but the windows were over six feet above the floor level. So, oh, they, so they gave lots of, lots of, yeah. well, no, it was distractors. Uh, it was that you could see the trees, you could see the light, but you didn't see roads and you didn't see distractors. Okay. And the most important part that I did was sound attenuation. And this was a very interesting task because the architects didn't even understand what I was talking about. And I was talking about reducing low frequency sounds in frequency bands that they didn't even think about looking in. Like fans and vibrations. Vibrations, the yes. low end, because they're using decibel meters that are using a scale called DB, uh, I mean, a DBA, which is an A biasing, which all it means is that it's, it's as if it's not really measuring sound pressure level. It's measuring what sounds would sound like in intensity if you had an optimal ear. But when you're dealing with autistic kids who have auditory hypersensitivities, by definition, they don't have optimal ears. So I was trying to get all those low frequencies out. Uh, something that I determined just in the course of quantifying my nervous system and being a professional biohacker uh, was that I had frequency bands where I wouldn't hear well in in different ears. So just you know, 50 hertz missing here and there in the middle of it. So I was having a hard time with auditory discrimination. It, I had to work harder mm. to pick out the sound of the human voice than the average person. And I was able to to train that up so it became much less of an issue for me uh, using some custom-made soundtracks and things like that. Um, but even since then, um, I've always noticed if I'm in a part of a building that has the low frequency vibration, the stuff you sort of feel more than you hear, mm -hmm. it does, it just makes you feel uncomfortable. It's a subtle background thing, uh, but sometimes it's a corner of an office building. Like that, mm -hmm. that space has, it, it's it's almost not even a sound. It's more of a feeling, but it's an, it's a, mm -hmm. it's vibratory. It's not yeah. just, oh, that you know, there's there's bad energy in the corner. It's, it's there like, there is bad that? energy. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah. It's acoustic energy, right? Yeah. yeah. Uh, is there is there a standard for this? Is, is there are there people who focus on this? Like if, if you're building a skyscraper, and I have friends who are building skyscrapers right now, um, who are interested in in healthier buildings, how how the heck would you go about hacking that problem? Well, I think it's relatively easy. However, um, it's not where the state of the art is. So even if we start talking about intensive care units, in mm -hmm. like neonatal intensive care units. Um, the background sounds in the isolates, the little chambers where the preterm babies are, and the noise on the ward, it's extraordinarily high of a nervous system that is ill-prepared to deal with these challenges, especially since it is preterm. And during the last trimester, the whole neuroregulation of the striated muscles of the face and head starts coming in, including the middle ear muscles. And the middle ear muscles function as filters to dampen low frequency sound. And if they don't dampen those low frequency sounds, they will mask human voice. So you start finding in children who have auditory hypersensitivities, they are also the same children who have language delays. So they're not hearing the frequencies associated with discriminating different words. And not Daniel came on the show a while back who does work with autistic kids and she described it as sort of like they're trying to look through mud or, or like they're inside a blender and every now and then their face gets pressed against the glass and they can see out but then the rest of the time it, it's sort of muddy and it 
it seems like a similar descriptor to what you're saying there, where the the amount of noise is much higher and your ability to filter it out isn't there. So it would be hard to learn, of course. Right. And we have different types of metaphors about how these processes work. One of the metaphors is that the noise and the filtering is all on a cortical level. And another one, which is the one that I adhere to, is that some of it's on a cortical level, but a lot of it is on the neuroregulation of peripheral structures like the middle ear muscles. So they basically change is what we would call the transfer function. What sounds get into the ear is really what that middle, the middle parts of the ear are doing. And they are very effective in dampening low frequency sounds at 220 or 30 decibel attenuation. And if that's not occurring, the energy that's coming through the ear at the low frequencies, you just can't hear voice. It's just not there. And it doesn't matter how hard you try or how hard you try to train a person to discriminate, the signal to noise ratio is so poor. Uh, that is so fascinating. Uh, is there is there data on what percentage of people have a little bit of this going on and just don't know about it? Um, no. <laughs> <laughs> if you were to guess without data, it's just basically I would guess your life. I would guess to begin with that there's an age phenomenon. Because as people, you can just tell who goes to into loud environments like bars. Mm -hmm. You can ask, again, observing where do people sit in restaurants with their back to the wall or in the other areas. So we're very adaptive. And what we realize is that the environment changes for us. The environment may be constant, but it's different in our perspective or perception of it. The examples I love to uh, use as a as a as a visual is when a parent has an adolescent male child and they're in the car and they turn the, the car, they play with the car radio. And the first thing they do is they turn the bass up mm -hmm. and the volume. Well, first of all, the parents say, well, they turn the volume up and that's not always true. They'll turn the bass up. And then you ask the question, what's going on here? And the answer is the young people tend to have good middle ear structures. And if they're listening to a vocal track, they're not going to hear the bass. Their nervous system is going to attenuate the bass or low frequencies through that very efficient neuroregulation of the middle ear structures. So it becomes literally a psychophysical, a psychophysics of, uh, of perception of sound. And where you can see the parent who are already stressed with the kids in the car, the retraction of that neural control and the kids you know, not having the, that, that deficit. So you, you can see it in real time, in real life. And we all have experienced it if we're parents with children. Uh, you asked me the question about percent. The first thing is that many individuals who are aging are going to have that because there's a neural degeneration. It doesn't mean that you can't optimize it by exercising it, but it is going to start degrading. The other one is you have this other population of all these developmental disabilities they're going to have these sensitivities. And as you get older, people with mental health disorders, virtually all mental health disorders have sensory processing issues, and those may not be at the highest level of the brain. They could be brainstem regulation of the nerves regulating middle ear muscles and facial muscles. So 20%? <laughs> you want a number. <laughs> What age? You see, I'm going to throw it back at you. Uh, well, we, I guess we'd have to look at the, the age distribution of the population. Uh -huh. But I, my data shows 48% of people under age 40 have early onset mitochondrial dysfunction. And I believe mitochondria at the very lowest foundation of your sensing system. But I could be wrong there. Uh, so I would say, okay, whatever percentage of people under age 40, but over age 40, everyone has some of it. What I don't know is what percentage of that goes into you know, the, the sensory uh, issues that we're talking about there. Uh, so I, I, I guess I'm, I'm thinking if I was listening to the show going, I don't know if this is me or not, what are the odds if I'm just a, no a normal human being? And you're saying the odds are worse if you're older, it could be something oh, like this. Yeah. Uh, and, and, but, but if you're an average person, what, you know what? Well, I think you see labels are always dangerous. So we, mm -hmm. want, to, we want to just be careful there. But we could say, if you have trouble being in a shopping mall, 
if you have, if you feel that when you go to a restaurant you can't hear what people are saying, um, that you have difficulty talking on the cell phone uh, in public, these become you know symptoms or hints that you're you have problems in this area, and the numbers could be very very high. So I'm not going to disagree with you on any of the estimates. They can be very high, but I will say that being having these features is not destiny, that these systems yeah. are quite flexible and they can be rehabilitated and they are part of a state-related adaptive re response so that when we have auditory hypersensitivities and difficulty processing language, we're very prepared for predator sounds. We can hear you know, people behind us, we can react to it, we can hear the car coming by. Uh, we're, we're prepared to survive and this leads us into different cultural situations. That if you live in dangerous areas, your your body, your nervous system is tuned for the predator, for danger. If you live in upper class, uh, up a middle class suburb, now we're going to say upper middle class because of mm -hmm. the population shifts. Um, you don't know what I'm talking about. You know, you're in environments that are physically safe. Got it. So, so it is going to be environment based as well. Uh, you're definitely inspiring me to uh, do something to my brain so that I'll be able to differentiate the sounds of French, uh, which has always sounded like someone chewing on marbles to me. I, I, my wife speaks French fluently. I'm in Canada where there's apparently some French speakers in another part of the country. And I'll be darned if I can understand a word of that language. So maybe I'll hack my brain to the point that I can discriminate all that sound. <laughs> <laughs> There's always a possibility. Now, if someone wanted to strengthen this part of their nervous system, uh, what uh, uh, what's the the lowest hanging fruit, the, the most likely to make a difference for that? Okay, so that was where I developed the safe and sound protocol. It, which, it is the safe and sound protocol. Well, okay. yeah, that was five one-hour sessions um, that were basically uh, exercises of this system. Uh, and quite, I'm going to use the term, even though it appears when you listen to them that nothing's going on, they're really quite robust. And people, uh, uh, meaning, like I said, nothing going on. It's like what we're doing is modulation, modulating the acoustic frequencies. But when people haven't used those neural systems, they get extremely exhausted from just listening. And I developed a new intervention, which is not released yet, which is kind of, it's called, its code name is SSP Light. Ah. <laughs> so, so what it does is in the modulation of frequencies, it preserves some that were taken out in the original model so that people can feel, they don't feel like they're, the safety of the human voice is being lost. So when I was doing a lot of aggressive filtering of the sounds, human voice starts to disappear. Now for me, when I hear a song and the voice disappears, you feel it moving away. But when it starts coming back, you just have a big smile on your face. <laughs> wow. But if you have a trauma history, what if someone's going away, what happens? You're not there long enough in presence in your body to experience it coming back. And I didn't, I didn't understand that because when I developed this, I was developing it from my own body and I wow. didn't have the experiences. And I really got really enlightened about two years ago when I was playing six minutes of it during a workshop in London. And this to me, so, you know, as an American, we think of London as a sophisticated cultural center, but we forget one important thing about London. Everyone at your workshops will have a trauma history. Either, either right, either a reenactment uh, of, of their families or their immigrants going to London to get away from something else. I would say everyone, but most of them. Wow. So that you have now in this room, and this was a room with 300 people, uh, people, most of them have something in their background that is not mm. a positive visualization. So I'm playing this music, having a good time with my attitudes. And usually if I play a few minutes, 
people will say, oh, well, it was a really, you know, I had a wonderful experience. I was going someplace interesting mentally. Another person will say their ears were itching and then I get really excited because it's the bones in the middle ear structures. I say, that's really good. And some people say I felt nothing. But in this room, People were getting highly anxious. People were getting out of control. People, they had to have all the support staff of the, the you know, this was a clinical workshop. So they had some, uh, the sponsors had clinicians to help. So the people were coming in to help support the people who were having these reactions. And I had a little bit of dialogue and I had to stop the dialogue after 45 minutes. Whoa. Of, uh, it was a full day. Uh, uh, it was actually a two day workshop but 45 minutes about people having to express how they were feeling and the feelings were ranging from anxiety irritability and anxiety uh, and to those who were feeling they were falling into an abyss which is a trauma reaction disappearing and it was amazing and it, it took i it was amazing and it taught me so much about other people and so much about how to respect the vulnerabilities, the accessibility of other people. And it also made me start to figure out how you can use this powerful tool that was doing this triggering in a therapeutic model. Because in therapies, you always are, are using triggers, but you're allowing those triggers to resolve. And I would go say, and this is the beauty of this type of trigger is that it's not associated with a person. So if you have a therapist who, who triggers you, you now are angry at the therapist because your nervous system starts detecting the therapist as an aggressor. And your narrative says, why are you doing this to me? Mm -hmm. When you hear two minutes or three minutes of music and your body gets this way, you don't get angry at someone you say, wow, how is this happening? And then and you become aware that there's something going on in there you didn't know about. You didn't know about. And with good therapists, they support and allow you to now resolve it. And the therapies resolve these problems when top down meets bottom up. With basically, so your bodily reactions now have a top down narrative that keeps it contained. It says, wow. My body's reacting. Why? So, for, so you've encouraged me. I, I think I was intrigued after our first interview to do the safe and sound protocol, uh, but I never found someone near me to do it. So you've, you've encouraged me to to go actually uh, do that. And to do that, I uh, I guess I go to the website and find a, a, you, a practitioner. Do you have a directory on there? There's a directory. Fortunately, it's not my company. So it's, yeah, no, it's something uh, you invented, but yeah. Yeah, which is the beauty of, of being able to hand off the yeah. person there's a education and research director just call her or send okay. me an email and she will identify a person for you okay well i'm thinking that listeners a good number of them will probably want to do that as well okay. and and just i i'm going to put a little uh warning out there for people i've done sensory integration work mm -hmm. and okay maybe i have an unusual nervous system the odds are pretty high based on the data that i have uh, but when I did reprogramming of my visual system, mm. uh, I did fix my vision and had all sorts of improvements and it kicked my ass. I was tired mm -hmm. every Saturday morning. I would do this and my brain was re redoing something yeah. and I would just need sleep. Like it, it's, it's not something to be, Oh, I'll just do it right in the middle yeah. of my day. You're probably going to need a little bit of recovery time afterwards. Uh, my question for you, Stephen, is, um, I'm it, assuming the auditory stuff is pretty similar. Like it's, it's, it's very, it's brain. very similar. In fact, one okay. of the, the key symptoms or features that when someone's going to get improvements is how exhausted they are from the intervention. Yeah. The uh, company that distributes it, and they have a web page, is Integrated Listing Systems. All right, and, and just to be really clear, um, Stephen is not selling that. He invented the tech, doesn't, doesn't run the company or anything like that. I, I have no deal here. I'm just interested in yeah. this stuff. So Integrated Listening Systems, all right, cool. Uh, I will put that in the show notes for you if you're driving. You don't want to pull over and write that down. Steven, I really, really appreciate your work. Uh, there's my gratitude for the day. Uh, you're, uh, you have this keen observation ability that's allowed you to, to pull these things out 
of patterns that have been invisible to most people for most of human history, as far as I can tell. So keep doing what you're doing. Thanks for being a guest on the show, and uh, thanks for being in Game Changers uh, with your work around gratitude. It's it's profound stuff. Well, thank you, David. Uh, enjoyed our conversation and look forward to having others in the future. Thank you, David. If you like today's show, you know what to do. Go out there and do something to be grateful. That's uh, That's your homework for today. And you can be grateful by saying thanks to the person who makes your coffee in the morning. You can be grateful by saying thanks to someone who made a difference, send a text message to someone you haven't talked to, anything like that. It actually really does something cool for your brain. And just watch what happens when you do it. It feels good. So yes, gratitude is a selfish act. It's okay.